This talk's going to cover the work I've been doing within the laboratory at the University of Essex over the last two years. These two years have gone past incredibly quickly, but I think we've managed to get some pretty cool stuff achieved in that time. As my slide title suggests, I'm here to talk to you about the development of a biologically inspired hearing aid. The focus really is on the biological aspect of this, and that's why we've decided to give this the funky title, BioAid. So without further ado, let me skip to the end. So what we've done is we've ended up with a, a prot prototype hearing aid that runs on mobile operating systems quite comfortably. Now, this is primarily intended to be a research tool and it's going to be given away for free, but it's still going to be very useful for some listeners in certain situations. It's certainly not a gimmick and it, it has useful features like low latency that make it certainly usable. Um, now this isn't just a standard hearing aid that we've put onto a onto a phone or, or or any mobile device. It's a totally new type of algorithm, a new class of algorithm based on the the biology. Um, it's not going to replace a state of the art behind the he ear hearing aid, but having this kind of interface allows us to do some cool stuff in terms of user interaction, and hopefully this will stir up some interest and in the research community in our project. And I've written in brackets underneath this at the gain stage because that's what this talk is really focused on. Um, modern hearing aids provide all kinds of processing functionality in terms of microphone arrays and beam forming and noise reduction techniques, but I'm going to really focus in on the gain stage of the hearing aid. So what it needs to do is provide or, or give audibility of sounds that would otherwise be inaudible to a hearing impaired listener. Um, so hearing impaired listeners have generally have a raised threshold of hearing, so they need some kind of gain boost in order to hear the sounds that normal hearing listeners can hear. However, normal hearing listeners and impaired listeners tend to have a similar maximum level at which they can tolerate sounds. So you have to be careful when providing gain that you don't over amplify sounds that are already audible. And you should be able to do all this processing whilst maintaining the cues that give you speech intelligibility. Now, there are two ways of doing this. You can either have an engineered approach or a model driven approach. Now, as standard, the hearing aids that you see on the market use this engineered approach. And what this has done is this has given us like the advancement from the ear trumpet shown here through to the modern all singing, all dancing hearing aid. Um, so, the general process of this is you, you measure a listener's sens to sensitivity to sounds and if you think they need a gain boost in certain frequency regions you, you apply gain and then in order to prevent over amplification you then use a, some sort of compression algorithm but in order for this compression algorithm to be effective it needs to be fairly fast and fast compression doesn't sound particularly pleasant so then you mix in a slower compression to complement this and then you can go further still, and if you're processing audio in blocks of samples, you can use look-ahead compression to refine this process more and more, and you get a more and more refined engineering solution. Now, another totally different way of looking at this is seeing how a healthy auditory periphery functions, and then having complete trust in the evolutionary processes that have gone on to give us the ears that we have now. And what you can do is look at what you give, give detailed hearing tests to, to listeners and try and examine exactly what parts of the peripheral processing might not be functioning optimally and then simulate those being faithful to the processing that occurs within the auditory periphery to try and give the listener back some of that functionality and that's what we're doing with the BioAid project. So in a nutshell BioAid at its core is a model of the auditory periphery and the, what I mean by the auditory periphery is shown in this image here at the top. We have an outer ear, an ear canal, uh, some middle ear processing and then the really interesting stuff happens when we get into the cochlea which, which takes the, uh, this, these mechanical vibrations and then finally converts them into some spiking information that's sent up the auditory nerve to the brain. So we can condense this processing into a uh, computer simulation that will take an acoustic waveform as its input and transform this through a number of processes and give an acoustic waveform at the output that we can present to the listener either 
either in off that is processed offline or that's processed in real time. Before we can really understand the processes that occur within the BioAid, I first need to give you a bit of an overview of the model of the auditory periphery that we use within the lab. Um, if you just take one thing away from the next few slides, it should be that we start out with a time domain uh, waveform representing the acoustic signal input, and at the output we end up with something called an auditory spectrogram, which gives you information about the activity that's conveyed by the auditory nerve up to the brain as a function of time uh, and from frequencies going from low to high and the darker regions in this in this plot represent a more intense firing activity of uh, uh, nervous firing activity um, to get from the stimulus through to this spectrogram we need to go through uh, a number of stages. Uh, firstly we have a model of the outer and middle ear and in the laboratory we simulate this very simply using some linear filtering processes and, and we won't really be discussing this for the rest of the talk. The really interesting stuff comes when we get into the cochlea. So the the bones in the middle ear have, um, well the middle ear has converted this uh, acoustical energy into a, into a mechanical energy form and this mechanical energy is transferred into the cochlea and this membrane that runs down the center of the cochlea vibrates in response to this motion. However, um, different parts along this membrane respond maximally to different frequencies and so you end up with a kind of frequency decomposition along the length of the cochlea. Uh, and at each part along the cochlea, we also have transduction processes that convert this motion into a neural firing code. And this is how we end up with this multi-frequency resolution shown here. Expand this uh, illustration slightly. Um, we can see that the, the, the cochlear function is modelled here by a bank of these DRNL filters. And this is what we use in the Essex lab, lab to uh, simulate the motion of the membrane that runs down the centre of the cochlea, and each of this each segment of this bank of filters has its own transduction process that converts this motion into a spiking output, and so each each row of this plot is corresponds to a different channel of the model. Now there are a number of different ways that you can simulate cochlear function, and each different model has its own merits. But the DRNL model is the one that we choose to use in the Essex lab, and I'll come into the details of this model in a couple of slides. But first off, I'd like to show some observations that are made about the, this basilar membrane response uh, in living organisms. So the first observation is that the motion of the membrane is not a linear function of the driving stimulus inten intensity. Instead, it's this three-part um, three-part input-output function is shown here. So first off we have a linear region down at low intensities followed by a compressed region over most of the uh, audible level range and at high intensities we get this return to linearity. The second observation that I'd like to draw your attention to is related to the frequency selectivity of this membrane. So different parts of the membrane respond maximally to different frequencies of stimulation However, there's also a level dependence here. So if you think of each region as a bandpass filter, at low intensities we have a shape like this with a certain center frequency, but as the intensity of stimulation increases as shown by these different lines on the plot, you get not only a change in the bandwidth of the filter, but also a, a change in the best frequency. Now, how can we go about simulating this? To simulate these observations, we use the dual resonance nonlinear filter bank model or DRNL model. If we remember a couple of slides back, we're now looking at this part of the processing chain. So this is composed of two separate pathways. We have a linear pathway and a nonlinear pathway. Um, now the linear pathway is made of a linear gain function as shown by this straight line, and it also contains a filter as a bandpass filter is illustrated by this arch. Over here on the right, in terms of input output, 
this linear pathway is represented by this green line. We also have a non-linear pathway which also contains bandpass filter components and also a broken stick uh, non-linearity non or an instantaneous compression function. And this is shown by the blue line over on this plot. Now, because this plot is in terms of dB scales, when we sum the outputs of these two pathways, then we end up with this net effect where the output of the two is basically follows the highest of the two pathways. And this gives us our, our three part um, nonlinear function that we observed. Now, another interesting feature that gives us our second observation that was to do with the frequency selectivity is that the filters in each of these pathways are tuned slightly differently. So as the linear pathway response begins to take over the nonlinear pathway, we see these sort of shifting uh, frequency selectivity effects. Now, after we've calculated the the basilar membrane motion using this DRNL model, we then need to convert this motion into a neural firing code, and we do this with a transduction model. And this sits at the end of the DRNL processing. Now, in the model that we use in the lab, this uses a vast amount of processing resources and a very complex process to simulate. But for the purpose of this talk, I don't want to go into those sort of details, but I do want to make the uh, audience aware of what this does in terms of its output. So there are two things I want to draw your attention to. First off is the firing rate as a function of time. You can think of these transduction units a bit like Olympic sprinters. They can pick up from no activity to an intense amount of activity in a very short amount of time, but they quickly run out of energy and tire and, head and, and, and end up functioning at this sustained response. The, uh, the second observation about this is, in this sustained portion, uh, the sustained firing rate is not just a linear function of the input to this transduction unit. In fact, they have a kind of sigmoidal um, input-output function. So by observing the firing rate, you can only get information from a stimulus level range of about 20 to 30 dB. So when you have this whole model, we can start doing some interesting things. Now we have the full model in place, we can start actually processing speech. So take this example here where we have the utterance 2, 8, 4, 1, and this is its corresponding waveform. Then we end up with an auditory spectrogram that looks like this. And this has some interesting features that we can relate to some of the process that I've, processing that I've discussed over the previous few slides. So the first interesting thing is this t in 2. Um, and this is only a very small amplitude signal, but it generates a big response in the auditory spectrogram because all of these transduction units are waiting ready to fire away at a high rate. And there's a small gap, and then you get the oo of two, and you also get another onset response of this oo sound. Now, this oo is quite a sustained high intensity um, portion of the waveform, but if we look at the auditory spectrogram, uh, the response isn't actually as high as, as, as the onset, even though the amplitude of the waveform is bigger. And this is due to this adaptation effect that I mentioned in the previous slide. Again, we can see these onset effects happen later. So if you have a relatively low intensity uh, portion of the stimulus over here, followed by another onset, we can see this response. And you can also see some other cool stuff in this auditory spectrograms such as formant tracks and generally we can see that there is quite a lot of information here about the speech utterance. However, if we add just a small amount of noise to the speech stimulus here then we can see that the auditory spectrogram changes vastly. I've used uh, this small red bar here to um, to indicate a, a, a constant noise to illustrate a constant noise source with a fairly flat envelope. And, and even though we're presenting this noise at a, a much lower level overall in the speech material, it's having um, 
a rather drastic effect on the information that is conveyed by the auditory spectrogram. So what happens is the noise drives all these transduction units into their adapted state. And so when you get the onsets of the speech, um, you no longer get these big uh, distinct onset responses. And in fact, you, you can't really make out much information about the speech in, in this spectrogram anymore. And it does make you begin to wonder how, if our model's correct, how on earth do people manage to understand spoken language in any kind of noise at all? However, all is not lost because we know that the auditory system has a secret weapon up its sleeve. So far, we've just been discussing the, what we call the ascending pathway, so this sequence of processes that leads us from the acoustic stimulus into some neural code that gets transmitted to the brain. But we know that this communication is bidirectional. There's also a feedback pathway that comes from the brain and goes back into the cochlea and regulates the processing there. So we have data to suggest that this control signal inhibits inhibits the action of the structures that give the cochlea its nonlinear response. And we can simulate this feedback in the DRNL model by placing a simple attenuator into the nonlinear pathway, thus reducing its, its output relative to the linear pathway. Um, we also know that this, this feedback um, is at least partially uh, a reflex. So what we can do is take a shortcut and rather than we don't necessarily need to simulate brain processes, we can um, simulate the action of this re reflexive feedback by deriving a control signal from the output of the transduction stage. So with this model in hand, what, what does this do to the representation of speech and noise? Well, I'll remind everyone again what happened when we had noise added to the speech uh, and there's no feedback in this image. So this little bit of noise here drives all of the transduction units into um, this adapted state where they can't respond to the onsets of, 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 the, of the speech tokens or, or to onsets of different parts within the speech tokens. However, when we activate this feedback network, we see a lot of this information that we had in the clean speech return. Now, how does this work? Well, what happens is before the onset of the speech material, the noise drives this feedback process and this feedback process in turn uh, turns down the, the response in the nonlinear pathway to a point where the transduction units are operating uh, near the base of that sigmoidal function that I showed you earlier. And what this means is because they're not responding very much to the noise now, that when we get some speech information, they can spike away and provide all this information and give us a lot more contrast um, again in this neural representation of speech. So, so in order to get an objective measure of of what this feedback processing can give us in terms of uh, in terms of improvement in information rate, we use an automatic speech recognizer. So we use the model output in response to connected digits like the 2841 example shown repeatedly and we use this to train a hidden Markov model based speech recognizer. We then tested this recognizer using digit triplets i.e. 239 or 401 and these were presented in varying levels of background noise. So what this plot here shows is the, the speech recognition performance over a range of different background noise levels. At this end here, the noise is very loud relative to the speech information and drowns out most of the speech. And we can see that the recognizer is performing in terms of percent correct at a very low level. At the other end of the scale, we have clean speech where there's no noise at all. And we can see that the recognizer's performing at a very high level and between these two extremes we have a continuum. So when we use the model with this feedback 
off, we can see that it performs very well up at 100% for clean speech, but as soon as you add any noise at all, it drops down in performance. And as you add a little bit more noise, and then this isn't a particularly bad signal to noise ratio or disadvantageous, it's, the speech is still 15 dB higher than the noise, but the performance of the recognizer has began to drop below 50%, and this just carries on back all the way down to chance. Now, if we enable this feedback net, um, this this feedback model, and then test this model in the speech and noise task, we see that again in clean speech it does very well. And as you begin to add some noise, it still does very well. And if you add even more noise, it's still doing well, and it doesn't begin to drop down in performance until the amount of noise is much closer to the to the to the level of the speech. And this is this is quite a this is an incredibly strong effect. So if we look at this uh, 10 dB signal to noise ratio point here, there's a 60% uh, recognition accuracy difference between the the feedback off and the feedback on model. Also in this plot, I have uh, I've plotted some human data that we have uh, performing exactly the same task as the speech recognizer. This is partly just to highlight the human machine performance gap that we have. Um, and partly just to highlight that we're not trying to claim that we're building the world's best recognizer with with this um, with this study. What we've been trying to show is the difference between these two plots here. I mean, is, is strong evidence that this feedback mechanism is is likely to be doing something very useful us, for us when we're listening in a noisy environment. Um, I'd also like to add that. This uh, this work here has been published in a paper just one week ago, and this is available now in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America. And this would be a very good point to give some credits out to um, my co-authors here. So firstly, I'll mention Guy Brown from the Department of Computer Science at the University of Sheffield, who helped tremendously with the uh, getting to grips with the, the, the hidden Markov model toolkit. And... Uh, I also mentioned that our fearless leader here, uh, Ray Medis and uh, Tim Jurgens from the University of Oldenburg. This is a good stage to give an interim summary. We've shown that the feedback mechanism that regulates cochlear processing is likely to be very useful when listening in noisy environments. But what does this mean for a hearing impaired listener? Well. The problem with any system that's reliant heavily on a feedback mechanism to operate correctly is that things go wrong very quickly if something in the upward signal path isn't functioning correctly. And we know that common types of hearing loss occur because of either deficits in the structures responsible for giving a nonlinear response of the cochlea or deficits in the transduction process. Either of these are going to affect this feedback pathway. So if you have a reduced output of your, your transduction system, you're going to have a weak feedback system. And so you're going to have this double whammy negative effect um, when it comes to, to your auditory perception. If you have a problem with the, uh, the structures in a nonlinear pathway, then you're going to have a reduced output from the cochlea, which is going to lead to a reduced output from the, the, the transduction, and also the, this sort of the, the feedback that you're going to get. Not only is this going to be reduced, but this directly affects the, pro the structures in here that might be damaged as well. So you're going to, going to get a triple whammy. So what can we do to help out? Well, this is where we begin to think about building a bioweight. Considering like the action, it all seems to be going on in this non-linear pathway of the auditory model, we should focus our attention here, and that's what we do. So we build a, a hearing aid version of the non-linear function of the auditory system with this feedback system built in, so that we can maybe replace some lost functionality. So what does this look like in the context of, of, of the entire hearing aid? Well. When we do this, we have we end up with a signal flow diagram. We have an input uh, stimulus that's split into a number of frequency bands by these bandpass filters. Uh, these go from low frequency to high frequency. Um, then we have 
a, a faithful reproduction of the processing that occurs in the nonlinear pathway of the DRNL model. So we have bandpass, an instantaneous broken stick compression function, and another bandpass filter. And then we have this feedback loop, which in the context of the hearing aid, we call a delayed feedback attenuation control. Um, the reason it's a delayed feedback attenuation control is because we deliberately impose um, a small delay to, to simulate the, the neuronal delay that we observe in, in the auditory data. After these processing blocks are completed, uh, we then apply again, and this is, this is just so that <coughs> uh, sounds that would have been in, inaudible to the impaired listener can be made audible once again. We sum the outputs of each of these stages, and this becomes the output of the hearing aid. Now, rather than show you some more diagrams and plots of how different stimuli look going through the aid, I think we can do something a lot more fun. So, who in the audience has used a bit of digital audio workstation software before to make some music? Anyone? Okay, okay, good. Then, then those of you that are, are into that kind of thing will, will, will be familiar with the kind of uh, audio plug-in processes that you can get for these workstations. And, and what I'm showing here is, is the, the, the lab scale prototype that we've built, which is basically just a big, chunky, glorified uh, effects processor that would run on, on one of these workstations, but it's, it's a standalone app version. Um, now, what we have here is a bunch of global controls at the top, and then each of these strips down here represents those channel sections that I showed in the flow diagram uh, on the other slide. Um, I'm not showing all the channels. In fact, there, there's channels existing between the ones shown, but their 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 parameters are just interpolated between these these channels. Um, and this this allows us to to do quite a few cool things. And it's a very good way of explaining the function of the A to people. So in each channel here, you can see. Um, these squares bouncing up and down. So here we have the input level, and on, on this axis here we have the output level. And as I speak, you can see these peak level meters bouncing up and down. And they're constrained by this instantaneous compression function shown here. So we'll keep focusing on this, this one kilohertz channel here. Um, I can, depending on the type of hearing loss the patient has that comes in, we can we can move this compression threshold up or down. We could even adjust the slope of the instantaneous compression if we see fit, like so. Um, of course, there's there's gain as well that you can apply, so you can just move the output up or down in a linear fashion. And then if you want to see the, uh, the action of the feedback loop, we bring down this red bar here, which is the threshold of the feedback control, and then we can see it doing doing its business, um, attenuating the input to this nonlinear function. And when you view this visually, what happens is as, as, as the attenuation kicks in, you need a greater input level to reach the same output level. Um, and this is kind of cool. And this has got some other tools that the, the audiologist can use. So these, this sort of green shaded region you can set um, to the listener's threshold. So if you, each, the range of each of these axes is 100 dB. So if you know that the listener can't hear anything below, say, 40 dB in this channel, you can you can set this visual marker up here. And then when you're in the lab and you're adjusting the parameters and you're presenting a stimulus, and for example, now if 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 this box is below below this line, then you know that the listener wouldn't be able to hear it at all. Um, so it does some cool stuff. I mean, sadly, I can't I can't just let you hear it now because we'll get screaming feedback. But fortunately, there is some direct-to-disc recording built straight into this application. So if I hit the record button now, I can just carry on waffling away like this, and I can do perhaps something obvious like change the gain up massively and bring the gain down. And then hopefully when we listen back to the recording, you'll hear this. So if we close this down, and we just listen to this briefly. Fantastic. So, aside from the software that I've just shown you, we have a fairly simple lab setup connected to this software, and this is this involves the software running on this on a laptop, and this is in turn connected to a high-quality sound card 
and then this is connected to actual hearing aids um, that a patient sits and wears and these these have these are wired specially so we can connect them to the sound card so the only difference between if we actually had the hearing aid built into the into the, the aid itself and this sort of outboard setup is just the bulk of, of, of it um, and my colleague Wendy Lacuse here has spent countless hours in the lab testing patients with all different kinds of hearing loss with the hearing aid. Now one of the main complaints that most hearing impaired listeners have is that they have difficulty listening to speech in noise. So one of our original evaluation goals was to uh, use some of our machine hearing techniques um, involved with this automatic speech recognition setup to see if we could like tune some para uh, some hearing aid parameters for these patients in their absence. One thing we can do with the auditory model is is deliberately uh, damage certain components in the model to simulate the, some of the problems that a specific listener might have. We were then hoping that we could uh, test this this impaired model uh, on some speech material and then apply the, the hearing aid processing before the model and see if we could optimize the hearing aid parameters to give the model the best speech recognition performance. But the problem is when we actually began to test the impaired listeners on the digit tasks, we found that they didn't actually perform too much worse than the normal hearing listeners. Now, this surprised us quite a bit. I mean, if, 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 if they're not performing much worse than a normal hearing listener, then it becomes very difficult to, to, to tune a hearing aid because you don't have much range to work in between perfection and, and no, no, no useful processing at all. Um, and what it turns out is the, the hearing impaired listeners aren't, aren't complaining for no reason. They can perform nearly as well as the normal hearing listeners when the speech is in the audible range, but they get exhausted by the effort required to concentrate on this speech. So when we found this, Wendy decided to go and pursue um, some other objective measures of hearing and some, some work she's been doing in loudness scaling has been particularly fruitful. But then this left me to have to think of perhaps another way that we might try and evaluate the aid performance. Um, so sitting down and speaking to the fearless leader, uh, he was. we were saying, wouldn't it be good if we could somehow get this hearing aid out of the lab and, and be able to take it home or try this out in a real world setting? Now, I was aware that you can do an exceptional amount of audio processing on uh, on on iOS devices specifically. I, I played around with there's there's a bit of software called Amplitude iRig, which is a guitar processing simulation. I mean, it's quite far removed from a hearing aid processor, but it's doing a lot of signal processing with incredibly low latency. So I was thinking, yeah, I'm pretty certain we can get this to work. So for version one of the ultra portable prototype, we got this Tascam IM2 device, which gives you um, a fairly high quality stereo input into into an iOS device. I then, when this arrived, I went to town butchering the thing, um, having a good fun afternoon with a soldering iron and some and some techie bits and pieces, and I made some cable extensions and and a headset. And here we have this wonderful fashion accessory hearing aid here, uh, worn by worn by Ray Midis. Um, so as you, what we have here is, is a set of ear defenders with uh, the microphones now mounted behind the ears and then these are now connected to the AD converter which sits on top of the head and this this is then connected into the into the dock of the mobile device um, via this extension cable and then the output is fed back underneath the ear defenders into the ear of the listener. So it, you're not going to win any fashion awards wearing this thing, but we found that the sound quality was actually pr pretty impressive, and we thought, well, this really is a goer. Perhaps we can, perhaps we can move this to the next level. And so what we did was we made uh, a version that would be more more easily released to a, a, a much wider audience. Um, and and this is where the BioAid uh, 
at Fussbourne. So I'm not going to win any uh, <laughs> any awards for UI design with this what well, this bad boy. I'm not a graphic designer, but it is it's it's very fit for purpose. Um, so top left here we have an on off button and we have some metering of input and output levels as you run the aid um, just to give you some sort of visual feedback of what's going on. And then when you start the application up, you're presented with this home screen, and this this is a num this is six different presets, and this is based these presets are based on Wendy's exhaustive work really in the laboratory, uh, finding out some settings for our bio aid that are particularly suitable for people with different types of common um, hearing losses. So this when the user starts up this app, they can sort of switch between a few different presets and just find something that sounds comfortable to them and hopefully one of these will. I mean we've had at least one listener from each category, uh, uh, at least one hearing impaired patient select each one of these so we know that we're sort of on the right track with that. And finally at the bottom here we've got um, a simple noise gate threshold control. Um, we don't have any fancy uh, sort of adaptive noise cancellation algorithm built into this, this app but we do have a gate that the user can adjust if they're listening to say a particularly high gain setting and, and just the background hiss of the processing is getting irritating they can pump this up. Um, so the app is just more than this one page of presets. Uh, the user can sort of hit an information button if they like the sound of one. This will give them some more information about this preset and they can also swipe their way across to other screens. So for each one of these six presets, there's a whole page of uh, of related presets to to these demo presets, and these go from setting one, which is a fairly mild processing, up to setting four, which is some fairly aggressive signal processing. Um, and so and so, what what this gives you is uh, this will keep the, a user of this application entertained for some while, I think, because they've got 30 presets which they can flick through and hopefully hopefully find something that's useful for, for different settings. And we hope that if we get this out that people will will give us a lot of feedback on if they find particular settings particularly useful for, for in, in certain listening environments um, and this would be great. Another thing to mention is that we're not the first to um, produce an app that's supposed to enhance hearing. Uh, my colleague Wendy sent me this this uh, article in a, in a hearing magazine uh, which details some app, apps to make you hear better but the one thing that really sets us apart I think is our totally unique take on how we're doing the processing in the algorithm and also the fact that we're releasing this thing for, for, for free as a research tool. What else have we got? I've registered uh, bioaid.org.uk um, and this currently points to a fairly bare GitHub page at the moment. Um, but this will shortly have uh, an algorithm code repository, so all the algorithm source is going to be completely open. Uh, and this contains a, a MATLAB version of the aid and also uh, the real-time C++ library, which uh, which is pretty efficient and, and, and will, will run on all manner of devices. And I'm hoping that people will just take this code and port this to every every device under the sun, it's, it's, it's cross-platform C++ uh, or as cross-platform as it can be. And um, another neat thing is there's a, a MATLAB extension that you can build directly from this so you can test the output of the two against each other and you can check that you know both versions giving you the same thing. Um, we'll hopefully get some technical documentation up for people really interested in, in the architecture of the aid onto this site as well as user documentation and something we're currently thinking heavily about is that's a, a real important part of doing this is some kind of user feedback portal. It'd be really useful if if we could find a really effective way of of, of getting user feedback on on how people are getting on with this. And this leads me on to a slide where I think about the future. Now, with a handheld device hearing aid like this on on a, on a programmable you know, on a programmable device, it allows us to go so much further than what we've done so far. So the other objective tests that, that, that Wendy's been running in the lab 
um, you, you could put versions of these into into the app itself, and therefore you, you can have a a testing framework built straight in that you can then optimize parameters for specific listeners from. Um, another thing that you could do is you could provide really advanced control over all the parameters in like a sort of hardcore advanced mode of the hearing aid. And there'd definitely be a market for this kind of thing. If, if you go online, you'll find hearing aid hacker forums of people desperately trying to get into the, the guts of their hearing aid to, to feel that they're sort of taking control of their own their own impairment and, and 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 there would be a considerable interest in this and if you do something like this then you open up the possibility for a, a, a social networking aspect of of this process so you could serialize all of the all of the hearing aid settings into some human readable sort of xml type format that you could copy and paste uh into a website or in, into a, a web application of some sort and allow users to to share ideas on how to set parameters and this 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 is this is an idea that wouldn't be restricted to just our algorithm you could do this with any hearing aid algorithm but it, it would also be very useful for the scientists and engineers behind the process to just see how how your application will evolve when it's sort of out of your control um, and finally, I'd just like to reiterate the fact that what we've built here isn't a replacement for the 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 uh, or, or the health the hearing health service as it stands. We're hoping that this will drum up interest that that people that might not have gone to see an audiologist might try this and then think, oh, perhaps I could do with a hearing aid, and they go and see um, a healthcare professional and and. And we hope that by making this free, it's just it's just a very uh, available device.